From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom right here on Can TV, where we always are. Today, the County of Cook. It's the government that many Chicagoans don't really understand. In a way, it does a lot of the things that nobody else really wants to do. It cares for the sick. Let's see if we can think of the things it does. It cares for the sick. It runs our jail. It collects our taxes. It operates one of the biggest court systems in the United States. And it spends a lot of money. So no surprise, it's got a pretty serious budget shortfall. About $315 million at last count. And in fact, the job of filling that hole is going to fall largely to our guest today. We're very honored to have the president of the Cook County Board of Commissioners, Tony Preckwinkle, as our guest today. Hi. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here, for taking time to visit us here at Can TV. Um, we have big structural problems that are that are plaguing us uh, as, a, as a country, as a world. I mean, if you see the headlines about Italy today and yesterday it was Greece and uh, somehow or other elected officials, public officials, particularly on the local end, are really taking the brunt of this because there's less money and yet the, the bills are still coming in and the responsibilities haven't really been reduced. I was struck by something that is a little bit, a little bit off kilter for this, but 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 a good way I think to start. There was a report out yesterday from the real estate online company Zillow. Uh, they said, I'm going to just quote you some numbers here. They said that 46.2 percent of single-family homeowners in the Chicago metropolitan area in the third quarter have negative equity, meaning basically underwater. Their houses are worth less than their mortgage. Almost half of the people in your, your jurisdiction, Cook County. Um, it was 32.9% a year ago, so it's gone up significantly. And home values have fallen 37% in Chicago since 2006. 43% of all homes in the area sold recently, sold for a loss. Uh, startling and uh, disturbing. Um, so I'm a history teacher, mm -hmm. and um, you know we talk about this as a as a great recession, but I think it's a depression. Mm -hmm. I mean these are the worst economic times that we've seen since the 1930s, right? 1929 stock market crash. Um, we used to routine, routine, routinely, boy, I can't get it out, routinely talk about depressions in this country, but after the the incredible and lengthy period in the 20s, late 20s and 30s, uh, ending only with the, the Second World War, we began to talk about our economic downturns as recessions because they were mild and modest in comparison mm -hmm. to the Great Depression. But I think we're in another one of those terrible deep troughs and uh, I'm not sure how quickly we're going to get out of it. A huge part of the problem that you face as a government official is that over the years, we've become so dependent on property taxes to, to feed our schools and to do all the sort of government functions and at the local level. And of course, now that's something that nobody can touch. You can't, you can't even talk about raising property taxes. So you're kind of caught in this weird bind of your, your expenses don't really go down significantly. You can cut around the edges, you can trim things, you can make things a little more efficient than they were, but you got to find that money somewhere. You're just like, so in other words, you're just like a homeowner. We, um, we take $720 million out of the property tax pool. That's the same amount we've taken since 1996. So the county has not raised property taxes for 15 years. Mm -hmm. However, property tax bills have increased substantially as any homeowner, anybody who's owned a home for the last 15 or 20 years will mm -hmm. tell you. Mm -hmm. It's mostly, frankly, our public schools. Yeah. That's where most of your tax money goes if you look at your tax bill. Yeah. Your local public schools are at the top with the greatest percentage. Um, and I'm a teacher, so I'm a big believer in public education. But I'm just saying, when people think about their property tax bills, they mm -hmm. tend to think, you know, it's all the city's fault or it's all the county's right, fault right. or whatever. But it's really, it's really our public schools. And if they thought about it that way, I think they might be a little less angry about it. But um, Todd Stroger, my predecessor, uh, raise the sales tax. So we have two basic sources of income, property taxes and sales taxes. Raise the sales tax by 1%. The county had been taking three quarters of a 
percent, and then it took one and three quarters percent mm -hmm. in terms of sales tax. One percentage point. One percentage point. Right. One percent we could have lived with. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, what happened was um, there was an incredible backlash from uh, county residents, and before I got to the my present job, um, half of that one percent increase was rolled back. Mm -hmm. Half of the penny increase was rolled back. Um, and when I became president, I promised that I'd repeal the rest of the increase. So a quarter of a percent in, in 2012 and a quarter of a percent uh, by the beginning of 2013. So all of the, the increase that Todd Stroger enacted will be gone by the end of this coming year. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a um, we're shrinking our resources, and we still right. have services that we have to deliver. So uh, just just to, just to re recap here, you're getting no additional money from property taxes, no, none more than you've had in the last 15 years, and income taxes briefly spiked and have been rolled back to where they were, what, a year ago, approximately, right, two years ago. Not income taxes. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sales tax. Sales tax. Sorry, sales sales taxes. Yeah. So. So within a very short period of time, you're going to be getting no more revenue from these sources, really, generally speaking, than you were getting years ago. By the, by the time we've re repealed the, the last quarter of a percent of the sales tax, we'll have saved taxpayers $400 million. That means that's $400 million that the county doesn't have mm -hmm. to operate its programs. And as you pointed out, I, I think there are a lot of people who are unaware of what the county does. Two-thirds of our money goes to health care and criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So about 35% runs our health care systems. Um, John Stroger Hospital, we have ambulatory clinics, walk-in clinics, and we have a public health system. And then our, our criminal justice system, our court system, is about 39%. So mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're talking about county tax dollars, the overwhelming majority goes to public health and criminal justice. See, one of the things that I've always thought was really difficult about about the county government is that the city provides the services that everybody sees when they look out their door every day. They garbage see the police, police car go by, fire. they pick up the garbage, they, fe they fix the street lights, they do all these things. You can quibble and complain about that all you want, but you can see your tax dollars At being work. work. Being work. With the county, you're dealing with these things like, we have to pay you to collect taxes, <laughs> we have to pay you to provide health services for people who mostly don't use it, uh, you know, all, all these kinds of, we, we, we pay you to operate the jails, to run the courts, all these things that we hope we never have to deal with. So it's a, it's a much more difficult kind of government, I would think, to operate than, than the city. Well, you're right. Uh, people don't see the immediate benefit of their, of their tax dollars at work in the way that you do um, when you see the police officers or the firefighters or the garbage trucks out on the street. And for the city, that's about 60% of what we spend. It's, you know, public safety and streets and sand, mm -hmm. sanitation. Right. So, um, but these are critical functions. I mean, we can't have a society in which people without insurance or people who are underinsured just can't get medical care. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not good for them and it's not good for the rest of us. Right. I mean, um, what I try to say is, okay, so you, you, you'd be happy if people who had tuberculosis and couldn't afford treatment didn't get it and w were therefore uh, conduits of it to all the rest of us mm -hmm. uh, or in flu epidemics. As long or, as you don't say that at a Republican presidential <laughs> debate, you're going to be okay. Right. I'm not a Republican and I'm not in that arena, thank <laughs> God. Um, so, you know, spending money on public health, investing in your people is always a good idea. Um, not, and it's a good idea from a societal point of view. It's a good idea if you think about it, you know, just selfishly. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't, I want to be, I want to live in a society in which people who need care get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a lot of people who can't pay for that care. Likewise, you may never use the criminal justice system. Uh, you, if you're lucky, you don't have any contact with it. But you want a society in which uh, we deal with those who are accused of violent crimes and. Um, and everybody has an opportunity to a fair trial. So the things we provide are critical to a, to a civilized society, although they're kind of under the radar for most people. Um, and, and that makes it hard to um, kind of sell the county as a unit right. of government. In addition to that, I think it's fair to say that over the decades, the county being the less visible of the many governments has been subjected to a lot of um, political shenanigans and, and, and uh, what 
the, the favorite term used to be bloat, uh, that there were a lot of people working for county who probably weren't qualified to work there or didn't need to work there. And there has been a lot of criticism ladled on the county in the last 10 years or so that uh, it has way too many people working at way too high salaries and not really delivering much for the, for the value. So you have, to, you have to deal with that too coming into your job. Well, uh, what I usually say is um, I was elected, um, for which I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I inherited uh, a mess. The, the double-edged sword, when you uh, succeed somebody who isn't paying attention to the job at the very best or is inept at worst, um, is that things are a real mess, but the bar is low. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> by comparison, if you just do your job and work hard and, and try to be conscientious, you look pretty good. On the other hand, there's a lot of garbage to clean up. So, so that brings us to the fact that that this is your first your first full year's budget that you're trying to fabricate now. And no, actually, we walked in the door and we had to do a budget. Well, but there was no preliminary yeah, budget. Okay. There was well, nothing. That's right. I forgot so, that. so the walked, detail I had yeah, forgotten. Yeah, right. No, right. I haven't yeah. forgotten. So <laughs> for the first two months, we had to put a budget together. That's Usually, right. you get a whole year to do that. Um, we finished that budget process and submitted it to the Board of Commissioners in, in, uh, at the end of January. It was enacted at the end of February, and we immediately started on the next year's budget. So, <laughs> You're not bitter about this? No, anything? I'm not no. at okay. all. Okay. Um, so in the last year, we've done two budgets, yeah. uh, and we're trying. Uh, Chairman John Daly uh, assures me that we're going to get this budget passed. Uh, before Thanksgiving, so well, that's let's, good. Let's just take a quick look at the, uh, well, let's fly in the um, Cook County helicopter uh, uh, to get an overview of all of this. Uh, your budget that you're proposing is uh, uh, $2.94 billion, mm -hmm. and it has a shortfall of about $315 million, as I understand it right now. Uh, obviously, as you've said, two-thirds of it goes to public health and public safety, but you've got to find this 300 million roughly, uh, and, and that's got to come from? Everybody. Everybody. Shared sacrifice, yeah. shared pain and sacrifice. That was my message from the very beginning. It's still my message. Now, of course, we should, we should deal first of all with the fact that uh, um, your friend, uh, Commissioner Beavers, says, hey, if she had just left Todd's money in there, we wouldn't have this problem today. But I'm she sure had that, to go I'm and sure, take that away. I'm sure that Commissioner Beavers would be interested to know that you described him as my friend. Um, He's everyone's <coughs> friend. <coughs> He's not my friend. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, Commissioner Beavers should understand that I pledged when I ran for office that I was going to eliminate the sales tax increase, which I've done. Um, and furthermore, Todd Stroger, who enacted the sales tax increase, finished fourth out of four in a Democratic primary, and he was the incumbent. So I think the public sentiment is that um, this sales tax increase was inappropriate, especially since there was no effort to um, try to make the government more efficient uh, and serve the people better. Um, the the answer to the problem was simply let's just raise taxes. Um, so I, you know, I I have no apologies for the course that I've taken, and I think it's one that the voters uh, expected and wanted. So you, to be more serious about this now, you you're faced with this issue where you have to you have to raise some revenues and you have to make some cuts, uh, just like every other government and, and every household probably in America right now. You got to raise right. some revenue. You got to make some cuts. Now you're talking about a few things. Uh, I guess we should make note of the fact that you had originally proposed uh, to make jurors uh, park in the parking lots, and you backed off of that. Well, let me tell you. You know, I've been at, I've been called to juries downtown. So have I. Yeah. And, and that you know, if you drive, you got to pay to park. Yeah. And or if you take the bus, it costs you five bucks or whatever. Yeah. So it didn't which, seem which to which takes a big dent out of that seventeen dollars you get for being a juror. Right. Yeah. But you know, it, it's your civic duty. You uh -huh. wouldn't want to live in a society in which nobody was willing to be a juror. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but. We got some pushback on it, and frankly, um, jurors, witnesses, police officers are now going to be excluded from mm -hmm. having to pay for parking. But I, I will just say, this is in response to you know the uproar. But I don't think it's I don't think it's unreasonable because it, why should jurors who are called downtown be different from jurors who are called to our suburban courthouses? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you call downtown, you got to pay. You got to pay that fee. But uh, that that was a, a, a kind of a, a minor thing it on, is. On, the, a... on the overall radar screen here. But I'm really fascinated by this thing that you raised about uh, unincorporated areas paying for police protection. I, there are. 
I, you know, it's one of those things that, that you, know, you read it in the papers all the time. All of us have lived here all of our lives. You always re refer to the unincorporated areas of Cook County. But there are 100,000 people who live in those unincorporated areas, and they get, their, they get services, but they, unlike me, who lives in the city of Chicago and pays for my police protection, they don't. So you're saying? They should. So, so here's the thing. There are 5.28 million people in Cook County, so 5,280,000 people. 100,000 of them are in unincorporated Cook County, so it's 2% of the population. And just as you say, it's not just if you live in Chicago, if you live in Schaumburg or Everett right. or Calumet yeah. City or, you know, wherever, Lamont, you know, you pay for your local police protection in addition to your county taxes. But if you live in unincorporated Cook, we provide services for you. And this is not, it's 51 square miles is unincorporated Cook County, but it's not compact and contiguous. It's little pockets all over the county. It mm -hmm. looks like, you know, Swiss cheese, yeah, yeah. right? So it's very, very hard and expensive to patrol. And what we're trying to do is we're going to spend the next six months or so trying to figure out how we can um, get these unincorporated areas to either incorporate themselves, mm -hmm. which is an obvious solution, mm -hmm. um, buy services from adjacent municipalities, um, figure out what they're going to do, or pay us. You or know. pay you for yeah, the services. They can, we, can, we can create what we call special services er areas, mm -hmm. special, special service areas, SSAs, mm -hmm. and then um, they can add a little bit to their taxes and we'll provide the service. But it's extraordinarily expensive and inefficient to do what we're doing now, which is try to provide police services to these little pockets scattered. Mm -hmm. They're not in Cook County, they're not in the city of Chicago, of course, because right. this is incorporated. Yeah, it's but, yeah. it's, but it's the suburban ring around us where there are 100,000 people in these little unincorporated pockets. I was actually surprised to see that it was 100,000 people. If you'd asked me, I would have thought it was, you know, 10 or 15,000 people. It's, it's a lot more than I, than I had thought. But again, even that is a, is a minor piece of, of this budget. <laughs> You're trying to find $315 million. So. You're not going to do that without making, as you say, some sacrifices. Some people are going to have to go. Some people have to lose their jobs, or they're going to have to do take days jobs. off, or do different jobs, do double jobs. Well, here's the thing: um, of that 315 million, the way we shrank it by 219 million was to make structural changes, and a lot of that, uh, frankly, was in layoffs. In government, about 80 percent of your expenses are personnel, right. as you know, right. and so when you've got a huge budget deficit, you have to lay people off. What I've proposed to our unions, we'll see what happens. Last time we came to an agreement with them in the middle of the night as we were passing the budget. So far there's, you know, there's not an agreement. What we've proposed to them is shutdown days and um, unpaid holidays. Um, a shutdown day, by the way, is something different. That's when the entire government shuts down for the day, right? right? Well, holidays are shutdown days. They're yeah. just holidays. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so one of the things you're talking about is just not paying people for holidays. Not paying people for holidays uh, and, and then shutting the government down on certain days. Um, it's a way in which we could save half of the jobs. We anticipate about 1,000 uh, layoffs, and we could save 450 jobs by doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if our unions will agree to it. Uh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Are there 450 people working for the county who, who how would you put this, are, are expendable, that, that you can do the job without them? Well, we went to every separate, here's the irony. So I'm, I'm chief executive for the county, but there are 11 other separately elected officials. It's not mm -hmm. like the city. The mm -hmm. city has the mayor, the treasurer, and the clerk, who are, mm -hmm. who are citywide elected officials in addition to the aldermen. Mm -hmm. You know, in Cook County, the sheriff, the state's attorney, the judges, uh, the assessor, the recorder of deeds, the treasurer, three members of the Board of Review. There are 11 separately elected officials. I haven't gotten them all, but anyway, 11 separately elected officials. So when we prepare the budget, we go to them and say, okay, here's our $315 million deficit. Here's your share of that. Mm -hmm. You figure out how you're going to cut your budget, right, okay? Right. And um, we sometimes have ideas that we share with them about what are maybe mm -hmm. we think are mm -hmm. obvious changes, and they have their own notions, and then there's a negotiation. And um, this time, last time we came to agreement with everybody. This time there were four kind of outliers, and um, we cut their budgets because that's what we had to do to submit a balanced budget. You know, if you're in the city, the county, the state, you have to have a balanced budget. It's only the federal government that can operate legally with unbalanced budgets. Um, so we had to balance the budget, and um, we submitted a balanced budget in October, and as I said, we hope to have it acted on by the end of this month. Now, uh, and obviously you're getting pushback 
from other elected officials on that. Uh, but, I, but I heard you yesterday on WBEZ, or a couple of days ago, was it with Tom Dart? And right. you guys seem to be playing nicely together. Well, the sheriff and, and our budget staff, you know, came to an agreement about what we needed to do. And so I was grateful to him. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to this, though, you're also talking about other taxes. And one of those is uh, you, you've got this alcohol tax that you, you seem to be getting a lot of. You get, we're getting pushback on everything. But this is another one where. Uh, I think uh, whenever you do anything to raise revenue, you're going to get pushbacks. Right. But if we don't pass these revenue enhancements, we'll mm -hmm. have more layoffs, which is what we've tried to talk to our unions about and others. So. You, you, you have been public about saying that, that um, putting, putting taxes on, on tobacco, chewing tobacco, all that kind of stuff, and on alcohol actually has some almost beneficial result in the end because it, it perhaps makes these things less accessible to people who you, you're going to have to end up Treating. You're going to end up treating them in your hospitals eventually anyway when they come in with emphysema or liver disease or whatever. Yeah. Um, tobacco has no health benefits. Um, modest consul consumption of alcohol isn't going to hurt you, but excessive consumption of alcohol leads people into our, our health care facilities with, mm -hmm. you know, multiple organ failure and all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. So what we said is if you buy a pack of cigarettes, you pay a tax. But if you buy smokeless tobacco or chewing tobacco or snuff, or if you roll your own, you have loose tobacco, you don't pay a tax on the tobacco. Mm -hmm. So we didn't think that was fair. If you use tobacco products at all and we think this is this uh, endangers your health, um, we ought to be taxing that as well. Your so. former colleagues over at the city council like that idea so much, they're proposing it themselves, I see today. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, on the alcohol side, we, we, I don't think we've raised taxes on alcohol in the county since 1989. And so we proposed a three cent a gallon raise. So it went from, um, I think, six cents a gallon on beer to, to nine cents a gallon on mm -hmm. beer. It's just mm -hmm. pennies. And furthermore, everybody's purchases are going to go down in cost because of the reductions in the sales tax. So it'll cost you less for your beer or your wine or your distilled spirits so anyway because, because, because of the reductions in the but sales what do you tax. Say, what do you say to the people who say, though, that this is a, this is a poor man's tax, that, uh, that, that people who tend to consume these things might be on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale and therefore you're hurting them more? I think people of all incomes um, drink mm -hmm. um, and people of all incomes smoke. Um, fortunately for this country, the rates of smoking have gone down and uh, I hope they continue to trend downward because it's a, it's a habit that's very bad for your health. You know, I, I watched my grandfather uh, die by inches of emphysema, and he'd been a two-pack-a-day smoker. And uh, believe me, I, I think I smoked a hack of a dozen cigarettes in my life and never picked it up. So, the um, the other thing that that governments are being forced into, and that that I I'm really beginning to find disturbing, is that more and more you're relying on these kind of nanny state things. Like yesterday, we saw in Chicago the uh, speeding cameras, red light cameras. The, the Tribune has a story today about the city amping up uh, uh, cell phone uh, things, uh, cell phone tickets. Some of these tickets are for $500. Now, you can't tell me that that's being done for safety. That's being done as strictly a, it's a gotcha way of raising revenue. And I, I it's just. It's the city, and I think you ought to take it up with people I, who I are fully in understand city that. government. I fully understand that. But, but, what I'm trying to get at, and I w I'd like to have you address, is this notion that because you can't touch property taxes and you really can't touch income taxes or, or sales taxes much anymore, you have to invent new taxes. You have, to come, you have to come at me in a million different ways and tax me for things that, I don't know, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel fair somehow. It's like, I think, it's a, like, I think it, Americans, it, Americans um, want something for nothing. And um, we've gotten used in this country to relatively low taxation. If you look at Europe, for example, their tax rates are considerably higher than ours. Um, and we want services, and we don't want to pay for them. Um, and this shows a certain <laughs> lack of reality on our part, you know? Um, Especially if you, ask you because you're selling me services that I'm claiming I don't think I even need or, or want. Well, you know, as I said, I think you know, in a civil society, you want health care for people who can't afford right. it, and you want a public health, public safety system that works well, too. So, yeah. um, no, I, look, 
I think that we're not reasonable in this country about taxation. And property taxes are actually fairer than other taxes, mm -hmm. um, but that's where you get the most resistance. And the fairest thing, of course, is income taxes. And in this state, we have flat taxes rather than graduated income taxes, which makes the most sense. You know, what really disturbs me is, you know, we live in a country where a f a f some of us are doing very well, a lot of people in the middle are getting squeezed, and the people at the bottom are really struggling. Um, and nobody's calling on the people who are doing well to do more. What the Republican Party is appealing to people at the top by saying, you know, what we're going to do is make you pay less for government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, basically abdi abdicate your responsibility to everybody else. You know, I mean, that's the, you know, I, I, I don't believe in leaderless movements, and I don't believe in just, you know, standing out in the corners yelling. So the Occupy Wall Street people, you know, make me nervous. But their point is, there are a lot of people at the top who aren't, who don't take it as their responsibility to give a hand to everybody else. And I think we've moved away from the notion that we're, we're all in this together, and particularly people who have done well owe it to everybody else um, to support their government, to be taxed fairly, and um, to do their civic duty. And it's, it's very distressing to me to live in a time when there's so much pandering to the rich instead of calling upon them to do their duty to the country which has provide them, provided them with their wealth and opportunity. One of the things I really wanted to talk to you about today, and, and we've just been squeezed out of time, is, is this notion that I think you've taken such a strong lead on that, that our justice system is so unjust to some parts of our of our culture and of our society, that there are there are people, and you, you've raised the issue of marijuana arrests and, and nonviolent, the, the people who are clogging up our jails that we're we're paying for, uh, when we should be spending that money to help them with their substance problems and that kind of thing. So I was in bond court yesterday. First of all, the th sometimes you have a paper on your table. Sometimes yesterday had an article in it about whites more likely to use illegal drugs and, and yeah. use alcohol excessively. Mm -hmm. But if you go to our court system, the people who are there, like, as I was in bond court yesterday, are black and brown. And they're there, a lot of them, for drug offenses. You know, Why is it that although whites are more likely to, to use illicit drugs and use alcohol excessively, that our courts are filled up with black and brown people on drug offenses. Mm -hmm. You know, what I usually say is that the jail is the intersection of poverty and racism yeah. in this country. Yeah. And disproportionately, African Americans and Latinos end up in our criminal justice system, um, often for low-level drug offenses that destroy their lives. They end up with a conviction of felony. First of all, they're arrested, so they have to report that. Any job ap in application, have you ever been arrested? You know, right there. Um, that felony convictions make it very hard for them to get decent jobs, to support themselves, to be active and, and, and uh, uh, productive members of their community. And um, we've just let this happen over time. We've, you know, our attitude has been lock them up for everything. Instead of trying to deal with our substance abuse problem by treating substance abuse, we're putting people in jail at a cost of $143 a day. I really regret that we have to stop here. But that is unfortunately that's that's what we have. We've got our 28 minutes and 30 seconds. So We've you know, spent inv it. invite me so, back soon. I'll uh, be I, glad to come. Will you come back again? Sure, of course. Okay, good. Then we'll pick, because I want to talk about that for half an hour with with Tony Preckwinkle. Thank you so much, Mrs. Madam President, for being with us today. Tony Preckwinkle, President of the Cook County Board. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. Let me talk very quickly here. You can uh, find us here on cable. You can also see this and other programs online at CanTV.blit.tv. You can check us out here. Subscribe on iTunes and all that kind of stuff. We're running a little bit late, but thanks very much for watching. I'm Ken Davis, and we'll see you next time on Chicago Newsroom. Take it easy.